Good evening from our headquarters in Kiev. This is the Sunday show on Hormatsky International, the only prime time show in English explaining Eastern European geopolitical storm, and I am Natalia Humenyuk. And I'm Ian Bateson. Tonight we want to take a closer look at oligarch politics. We also want to talk about the results of Ukraine's local elections and also talk about Russia's first casualties in Syria as well as the recent plane crash in Egypt. Now, as always, we want to encourage you to download our podcast on Mixcloud and to tell you that we have an app for the iPhone, which gives you access to all of the material produced for this show. And um, today, one of the first topics to start uh, is an arrest of the Ukrainian politician, uh, right hand of the famous Ukrainian oligarch uh, Igor Kolomoisky. This is Gennady Korban. You can see his uh, photo. Uh, former deputy head of the Dnipropetrovsk uh, regional government and the chairman of the Ukrop party. Uh, he was running as the mayor, but did, uh, the mayor of Kiev, and didn't get that much, uh, but is accused of creating an organized criminal organization and the embezzlement and kidnapping a government representative of a law enforcement officer. Uh, pretty hard to explain for a foreign international audience, but the big news in Ukraine, uh, because uh, these are the biggest, uh, let's say, competitors to the current president and current uh, government. Uh, we have here in studio Mikhail Minakov, who is the president of Foundation for Good Politics and Ukrainian political philosophy. Philosopher, uh, who we hope would help us to explain what it all means, why this guy, why it's so big, why it matters, and why now? Well, th there are many whys, and we still don't have answers for these ca causes. I'm sure that there is some bureaucratic inner logic in, the, in this process. So why now? It could be connected with some legal processes. But definitely there's political reasons as well. Well, because from the outside it looks like selective justice. Yes, and it could be the case. And if we look at the recent history, like recent two months, we can definitely see that the uh, former coalition, the former allies, the, the, the several ruling groups that came in power after Euromaidan, now they try to redistribute the power. So, and this redistribution in, of power is connected with putting aside those marginalized groups. Well, Hennady Korban is the head of a smaller party that wasn't very successful in none of the recent elections. But uh, at the same time, we definitely see this figure symbolizing the power of uh, Igor Kolomoisky, one of the oligarchs in Ukraine, in one of the biggest oligarchs in Ukraine. When he history. ran a campaign that was, a campaign that was very much anti Poroshenko, challenging, you know, his candidate Klitschko here in Kiev, and also going after, you know, the powers that be, the government in general. Yeah, if you look at the media belonging to the holding of uh, Kolomoisky, you can see that they actually use this uh, argument against uh, just, uh, just case for, mm -hmm. you know, bringing, uh, arresting uh, Korban. But at the same time, there could well be also real reasons for uh, arresting this person. So we are in a very dubious situation right now. There's definitely a, a sense of justice, because uh, the, the name of Hennady Korban is, is associated with so many uh, criminal sh his stories in, in the history of Ukraine, especially in wild 90s and early 2000s. But at we the have same a time, reputation as being a wild raider, yes. taking over other people's businesses exactly. and, you know, a sort of white-collar theft, basically. Exactly, exactly. And there were several attempts to, to murder him, also probably allegedly associated with this type of activity. I would explain this uh, photo as well we're showing now. These are the, uh, some kind of guns and weapon and money which had been seized from many, many offices. Uh, the party, it's not even the party, this political group has. Um, but, uh, but really, the, the, the first question, and that's what the whole, I don't know, Ukrainian opinion leaders, the journalists, uh, they all uh, asking why particularly him, because there are so many not uh, the crimes which hadn't been investigated, uh, everybody's searching for mm -hmm. the big fish being arrested, you know, like there are many more different oligarchs and that would be why to touch somebody who is more actual politically than 
And what, what I find so interesting from the outside, you know, as a non-Ukrainian who deals with all of this, uh, unfortunately it's the case in Ukraine that so many laws are, are broken, and the, just the degree and number of laws that are broken, when laws are enforced, especially by the SVU, especially when there's priority and when it seems directed, you know, coming from the president's administration, it really begs the question, why? And who's pushing for this? Because most of these, many of these crimes don't go uh, punished. Right, right. Well, if you look at our recent history of Ukraine, we, we had two cycles, full cycles of recovering of the political system after revolutions like Euromaidan or, or the Orange Revolution. And every time this recovery happens, we see how the new regime is being established, also using the uh, prison and using the general prosecutor office, mm -hmm. using SBU as tools in political game. So th there is definitely some signs, very disturbing signs, of a political functionality for those bodies that should be law enforcement. Mm. But it seems like a political powder keg, especially with so much of law enforcement, especially prosecution being criticized for doing nothing, you know, for Berkut and others who are active right. on Maidan. I mean, this seems very problematic. And then you have, I believe it was Pravi Sector saying in response to all of this, they're cleaning their guns, they're preparing for this. Yes, and that also puts the, 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 uh, this entire situation under question. If uh, this presidential group was really ready for this arrest, because I, I, I was definitely surprised to see how slow they are in responding to some legitimate concerns of uh, our society. And the president still didn't make any stance explaining what's going on. Uh, in the recent two months, even three months, there were more and more accusations of president himself in many misdeeds. And now the, the, the uh, networks around uh, Kolomoisky, they, they start accusing president in many scenes that may lead him to, you know, sacking the president. So it, the, this media war reminds me the, the media war in Russia in mid-90s, Gusinski and Teve and th this type of recovery. Yeah. yeah, we would like also to, you know, while talking, we can also show this just a small parts of the uh, various demos taking place in Dnepropetrovsk, uh, which is the kind of the capital for Kolomoisky and his guys, and also um, there. And do you think that would create a further disturbance? What would happen with that? Yeah, it may. Because there is some kind of uh, mobilization. Definitely. Definitely, definitely. And, uh, well, I would expect some, some president's address to this problem. He really needs to come out and explain what's going on. But at the same time, uh, if, if the presidential branch of power decided to go this way, mm. we would probably need to see uh, some new arrests. There, there are, as you correctly said before, there are so many laws broken by so many groups. Do we really see this cleanses period? Well, which could also be the case. Because it seems like part of the point you're making is that this is a period that we've seen before in Ukraine when the old guard reestablishes itself. It reestablishes its business interests, its connections to government. And an argument could be made that part of what we're seeing is that conflict now between Poroshenko, who is the president, but is also an oligarch who's done very well in recent years right. since Maidan, and between Kolomoisky and Korbin and others who represent a different oligarchical interest. Yeah, there are several. Well, when we use the this oligarchic uh, term, the oligarch, we kind of use an evaluative statement. But if we talk about in neutral terms, we, we're talking about some financial political group, FPG, that goes on and they have the several oligarchic figures, owners of big businesses, but also political parties belonging to them, some private armies or whichever you call these groups of military citizens that do not... Uh, follow any laws anymore. Mm -hmm. So th there's always a, a holding, media holding, that covers uh, the, the news the way they want. So in a way, we now see how this uh, oppositional FPG uh, reacts to the arrest. And all the means they have, including the right sector, including media holding and biggest channel in Ukraine, the, the way they present situation and ally situation. It's a very big message and it's a very risky period 
for the rule of President Poroshenko. Uh, but also what uh, the um, defense of Corbyn says, this is a political persecution, and you would read a lot in the Ukrainian social media, you know, that, you know, is it again some kind of the uh, movement to any kind of uh, authoritarianism or anything by, you know, taking away the political competitors, what would be your take on that? Well, I don't want to talk here about it in, in terms of either or. It could be both. Actually, there are some legitimate reasons, some illegitimate reasons for th this type of action. And I still doubt if it was clearly the presidential decision. So mm -hmm. that's why I'm waiting this uh, explanation from the first person. But again, uh, the, the, we've seen this before, and I'm sure it will happen again, and quite soon, probably with, uh, against other FGPs. But who, who are figures who could make these kind of decisions? You know, if you're saying you doubt that it could come from the presidential administration, who could be leaders for something like this? Well, in like September this? and October, we definitely saw several uh, attacks of several groups within this circle around president. So, Grigorishin against the, the head of the presidential administration, for example. Kananyanka is another figure. So, there's definitely a conflict in this group. And I think that one of the groups tries to make themselves more important. They try to put also the president into position to ally with them. So, they promote this risky situation, but also mm -hmm. uh, 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 trying to get more power than ever before. And um, another idea that it's another thought, uh, an explanation of this event is also that uh, compared to all the other oligarchs, you know, like Renat Akhmetov or Firtash, who had been very, very active during the uh, Yanukovych, during the previous government, Kolomoisky is the one who wants to play today, who wants to gain more, and he is really stopping the reforms, he is doing a lot of business, uh, trying to buy the people, to corrupt the people, to... Uh, there are the allegations that, you know, he plays with his minority rights, uh, hindering the privatization, not uh, making letting the foreign investors to come. Right. Um, so what would be also your um, explanation and, uh, you know, any ideas on this kind of allegations and thoughts? Well, it's, it's kind of time to push him away and to give this sign for Kolomoisky while arresting uh, his ally. Well, it, again, it could well be one of the reasons to act like that. So it's a message to Kolomoisky. But... At the same time, knowing uh, Kolomoisky's uh, usual way of responding to such kind of threat, I, would, I expect uh, Kolomoisky to fight instead of uh, obeying. And his today's uh, words, uh, the way he said that uh, President Poroshenko made Gennady Korban the national politician, politician of the highest league uh, in Ukrainian politics, well, it also it is true. Well, the thing is that uh, prison is one of the most important sources for today's Ukrainian power elites. If you look at the coalition, it's ruled by people with very good and several-year-long uh, experience in, in prisons. And by putting uh, Gennady Kernes, those around uh, president have probably created conditions for future career of this uh, person. But again, Gennady uh, Kolomoisky is, uh, I, I would admire him if it were not in Ukraine. Probably. He's the most creative person in our recent history. In these two years, he showed himself as a person finding solutions, unusual solutions, in the most, uh, the, the worst situation for his business, for his group. And he's still uh, running the biggest uh, bank in Ukraine. He's still running the, the, the show in Ukraine. Well, and connected to that, I mean, we've spoken about kind of the domestic political situation, but the fact is uh, Kolomoisky and politicians linked to him, Korbin and Filatov, have been instrumental in building up Ukraine's defenses and fighting battalions Absolutely. and all of that. What is the risk of this infighting uh, to weaken Ukraine from a potential external threat? Well... I don't expect this to really make an impact on the battalion movement in Ukraine. 
Well, if you look back uh, to the spring when we had the first conflict in, in March between President Poroshenko and Kolomoisky, we definitely saw the hesitation period in the ranks of battalions, and they made a wise decision to distantiate. They, they kept distance from this conflict, and today I expect it also to be the case. If not, we will see also how big is the network of uh, Kolomoisky private army, or whatever they call it. But we definitely, it's going to be a very interesting indicator how the uh, volunteer battalions react today. Um, that's a lot to watch and follow up. Thanks a lot. Um, Hailo Minakov, the president of the Foundation for Good Politics and Ukrainian political philosopher. We'll talk more even today uh, about the, uh, what's happening with the far right and all this risk with the um, Vyacheslav Lihachov, who is uh, also monitoring the far rights and all the uh, rights of the uh, minorities. That would be in the end of the program, but now we skip into the part because a week ago there were the local elections around the country. We would analyze them with a brilliant journalist follow, traveling around Ukraine, but before that we also would watch a Hromatsky report from the small village near uh, Kiev, how the people see this local uh, change in the local governors. Uh, are they happy? Are they welcoming it? Or uh, do they still have a hope for the better life? Расскажите, что у вас тут интересно. Вот вы мне, как журналист с журналистом, расскажите. А что у нас интересно? Раньше ездили, шукали работу. Там. Говорили, что я, например, работал в основном в лище, то есть пыльщиком. Регионалы опять лезут в власти. Ну что я один, я хрыч старый сделаю, так? Ничего не сделаю. Агитую всех. Щоб тільки не верталась ця власть, яка була. Бандити. Ну і, і наші от це, хлопчики теж грабителі. Горган в обласну раду, він іде наш. Вижгородський, як а, хто він? Нехай йде Бордо письмо, мені таке прийшло. Сильно просить. Да, треба дати. Письмо. Треба його вибрати. Да. Сильно хороше дядько. Пішла гарне письмо. Да. Горган? Так. Да. Удачі всім. В нашому нелегкому житті. Всій Україні бажаю.
All right, so as we mentioned before, we want to take a closer look at Ukraine's local elections. Those happened a week ago, last Sunday. We still don't have official results, uh, but we've had more of the vote counted, and we have a number of polls. Now, what's very interesting about Ukraine, especially when we look at mayoral elections, if a candidate does not receive over 50 percent of the vote, there has to be a second round election between the top two candidates. That means for many cities, the election is not over. Uh, if we can pull up, we have a map of Kiev, uh, and that'll give us some of the results that we have for that. We'll see that we have the party from, uh, there we go. Uh, we have Vitaly Klitschko, who's from President Poroshenko's party, who received 40.5 five, seven percent of the vote, or at least that's what's expected. Again, no complete results are in just yet. Uh, this would mean that he would have to go for a second round. Uh, so that election would not be over. If we can pull up the results for Dnipro Petrovsk, uh, we can look at that and we will see that there we are also expecting a second round. So we have Boris Volatov, who's from the party Ukrop, the Dill party, um, which is linked to Kolomoisky. And we have the candidate Alexander Vilku, uh, who had been a deputy prime minister in President Yanukovych's government, so we see neither of them has received more than 50 percent of the vote, so we're expecting a very hotly contested mayoral election there. Now, if we move on and we take a look at Odessa, uh, we can see this will be a close one. Um, so this is just a poll that we have here, where we have the candidate uh, who there has over 50 percent of the vote, and then we have uh, the second candidate is Saakashvili's former advisor, who did better than was expected, but these numbers change a little bit on which poll you're looking at. And there are a lot of questions uh, about whether or not there'll be a second round. So far, they've said there won't be, but again, this is something looked at very closely. If we take a look at Kharkiv, so the second largest Ukrainian city, uh, we see that we have Kemnes, who got 60, over 65 percent of the vote. This is key because this means he doesn't go for a second round. He would win outright. Uh, this is something that's frustrated a lot of people because they see him linked with the old establishment. And if finally we take a look at Lviv, a wonderful city in western Ukraine. Pull that up. Okay. And we have Sadovoy, a very popular candidate from Samopomich, mayor there, who is also not expected to have to give go for a second round. We wanted to talk a little bit about where things have happened, uh, happened so far, where it's all going. To that extent, I'm joined by Oliver Carroll, a correspondent for The Independent, Politico, and Newsweek, and by Sebastian Gobert, a correspondent for Liberation, RFI, and Le Monde Diplomatique. I pretend to know some French. Thank you for Sounds joining us. Nice. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Oliver, why don't we start with you, because you had this great piece in Politico this week looking at the big picture. Is this a win for President Poroshenko? Did he do well in the local elections? Well, I was writing the piece with, with only the, the, the very first exit po polls uh, at hand, so I think I might change my uh, general uh, perspective slightly. How would you um, retitle it now? What would it be? Well, it would still be Poroshenko hobbles on. It's, I wouldn't quite call it a modest win. I think it's fairly neutral. Mm -hmm. um, but um, certainly, you know, with, with regard to the subject we've just had, we wouldn't be talking about the arrest of Corbyn. And I think, you know, I'll probably go a little bit further than Mikhail and say um, the arrest of Corbyn would not have gone ahead were it not sanctioned by the president. I think that's, that's the fairly clear thing we can say. Um, if he was in the top two, do you think it would have happened? If who was in the top two? If Corbyn had been in the top two candidates. No, no, I think it's, it's, it's more to do with Kolomoisky. This, mm -hmm. this is not against Corbyn. This is more um, uh, nationwide. Um, uh, Poroshenko certainly sees the threats from, um, I mean, uh, let, let, let's say, that, let's, go, let's wind back a little bit and say that um, before the elections, people saw the main threat coming uh, from uh, a resurgence uh, Yulia Tymoshenko. She didn't do anywhere near as expected, which is why, I mean, I think I st I'm still right in saying that, you know, his worst fears have not been realized. You know, mm -hmm. he's received a, a certain relief from these elections. She because was, he doesn't have a real threat. There's no clear number the, he two. He is the Tina candidate. There is no alternative. You know, Kolomoisky, um, uh, you know, no, no, I would say that the, 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 the uh, a great uh, um, spectrum of, of um, forces would would uh, uh, come together in, if Kolomoisky was the other threat. Um, and, and in that re respect, I think I probably would agree with Mikhail. It's, it's sort of remin reminiscent of Russia in the 1990s when we had, uh, you know, Yeltsin in 1996. We might, we might yet see a, a scenario like that mm. where everybody... Uh, all the inverted commons democratic forces got together to force a rather undemocratic vote and, and fudge an election. Mm. 
So what do you, Sebastian, why don't you jump in? Are we back in the 90s? Is this uh, Poroshenko hobbling on, or do you have a different take? Uh, no, I mean, I would, I would definitely say that the <clears throat> Poroshenko is re-establishing the oligarchic system with him as a referee mm -hmm. in, the, in the middle, basically dominating the whole system. And, uh, and Which seems like cheating, because he himself is an oligarch who's done fairly well. Yeah, I mean, he is I, also the president. Actually, the, 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 the trick with the system, as far as we understand it, is that to, in, in order to control it, in order to monitor it, in order to actually keep some kind of order, you have to be an oligarch yourself. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, him being an oligarch in the, within, within this configuration is kind of a, kind of a fair, fair, fair thing. And coming to the, um, you know, that's just one part of the story, but with uh, coming back to the results of the local elections, uh, another place where actually the game between Kolomoisky and the, uh, the, the battle between Kolomoisky and the President Poroshenko had taken place earlier, it was Odessa, where instead of the Kolomoisky uh, supported governor Mikhail Saakashvili, former Georgian president, had become had been established as the governor, uh, but it didn't happen that uh, another his ally uh, had become a mayor of this city. Uh, Seb, you've been following the elections there, so can you explain us really what is the uh, the whole story about? We are also showing uh, two different uh, demos <coughs> against and for uh, current um, uh, current mayor who've mm. been uh, more or less elected. Well, I mean, basically, as you said, uh, as you said in the, in the introduction, the, the election is still not really decided because uh, everyone expected Trukhanov to actually lead the race in the first round, but to win something like 30, 35, 40 percent of the of the votes, and the fact that he wo he allegedly won something like 47 percent according to the first exit polls, and then now we see, according to the first uh, results, something like over 50 percent, then. It, uh, it means that something basically went wrong. And actually, we already know for sure that the elections in Odessa were the dirtiest uh, that took place in Ukraine, with you know, box stuffing, with uh, all kinds of uh, different frauds and violations. And the thing is that, uh, that when, when I say that the election is still not decided, it is that uh, the, 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 the Borovic side, so Borovic being the, the, the former advisor to Saakashvili, and the, the, the candidate for, mayor, for mayorship is uh, is actually taking it to court, and uh, they obtained yesterday or the day before the, the authorization. I mean, the prosecutor obtained the, the authorization to recount the votes. But the thing is that, uh, from from what I heard today from uh, from my sources in uh, in Odessa, is that uh, they, uh, I mean, the, the Trohanov people basically arranged for exchanging the ballots on the way from the local uh, election commissions to the to the regional uh, to the regional election commission Meaning so, they switch them yeah or? They, yeah they mm -hmm. switch them so then the thing is that now they could proceed to a recount but it wouldn't show uh, actually the, the extent of the frauds that took place but so. interesting also, we now talking to Odessa because the mayor is from former party of regions, the party of Yanukovych, but we can also show um, uh, that uh, in Kharkiv as well, the guy who had been the one of the biggest allies during the Yanukovych time, you know, there was a talks about Kharkiv's People Republic and mm. all the things. Later, he found his way with the current government, but still he has won. And this is a question for everybody. Why the people are voting? voting? Are they missing the you know, the old um, authorities or so, how would you explain? There are some explanations we know as well. Well, I think you said it yourself, the people are voting. Um, last year, I mean, we're all, we're all comparing this to last year's parliamentary elections, but if you look at turnout, it was way down in the East. And that's the one thing, I mean, it was widely reported that turnout was rather poor. It wasn't too bad in all. Uh, this, this election, but it was actually pretty good in the East. And so people who weren't voting basically turned out to vote. Um, but it does you know, come down to, 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 to un underline, you know, Ukraine is still, uh, still has this uh, bipolar in, in inheritance. It still does have people who lean towards, culturally towards Russia, who don't see in the current government necessarily that their people. And it still has people who see things completely the other way. And I suppose I would say that until Ukraine, Ukrainians politicians, Ukrainian leaders come to uh, um, an advanced understanding of what Ukraine means, and a way of overcoming that, you will continue to have this split. 
And that but means... is that really an explanation for voting for the old guard? I mean, can you explain people voting for Kenneth? Well, well Kenneth is, Kenneth is well, they, they, would, they wouldn't be voting for him if, if they weren't that way inclined. There's other, mm. with, with Kenneth, it's, it's more, uh, I mean, he's very popular because over five years he showed himself to be a fairly effective city mm. manager. He got an awful lot of subsidy from the Yanukovych regime, but in those five years, um, uh, Kharkiv has been transformed. But it's, I mean, that's what I mean, because you have cultural city. affiliation and you have a political machine. And many of these people who have been in power for these cities for a long time have a very powerful political machine with access to a lot of officials and a lot of money. Of course. I mean, that, 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 that's also part of it. But um, I, I think, you know, the, this, this is definitely the downside to the elections from Poroshenko's point of view. Um, you know, it could certainly be argued that, with the exception of Odessa, where, again, Barovik did very, very well, um, but that in itself has its own problems because Saakashvili is not an easy person to have on your side necessarily. Mm. He kind of lost the East. And, uh, yeah, there is a lot of uh, discussions uh, here as well. There were a lot of, you know, some kind of campaigns uh, from uh, Kharkiv residents that, you know, yeah, yeah, it doesn't mean that we want Yanukovych back. It's really for the good, better infrastructure that people still look at the, you know, they don't discuss maybe the politics, but look um, how it's for them. Uh, but it's definitely there is a lack of the new faces. But uh, going to the West in Ukraine, uh, we again can show the portraits of the current uh, Lviv mayor mayor, who more or less have established himself as a strong political figure, one of a very few new, really new faces. <coughs> so, um, Sebastian, you also uh, spend a lot of time in Lviv and uh, work there. And how would you say, yeah, how, what are these new political forces? Are they really kind of, what is their ideology? There were rumors, even the talks, that, you know, Sadovi would like to run for the presidency next uh, time. Oh, I don't, I don't really think that those are rumors. I mean, those yeah, are yeah, really, yeah, this is the talks, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, the very, intentions. Very, very strong uh, hypotheses and possibilities. Well, I mean, in, in, in VIF, like, the, the, the success of Sadovi is also a very, very personal thing. I mean, he has, you know, served on the wave of success of the city and really managed well the, the, the development of tourism and the, the, the attraction of, uh, of, uh, of business. So his re-election is not really... Uh, is not really uh, a surprise. What is really interesting is really the, as, as you say, like the new political force that represents his party, Samo Pomic. And Samo Pomic is really, uh, in, some, in some sense, it really um, represents uh, the, the, the ideas of, uh, of the Euromaidan with, you know, uh, a clear agenda of, uh, of reform, a clear, uh, a clear the desire to actually dialogue, <clears throat> establish a dialogue and a consultation with, uh, with people and really have some kind of a bottom-up uh, bottom approach and so on and so on. So, I mean, this is for now uh, very much based in, the, in, in Western Ukraine, but we see that the results, for example, in, uh, in Kharkiv, uh, in Kharkiv, in Odessa, or even in, uh, yeah, I mean, in Kharkiv, in Kiev, and even in Odessa, in some uh, in some sense, they actually mm. confirm that the, the the party and the, its ideas are really taking ground. Uh, but from both of you, um, I'd like to ask, you know, this is a local elections, but, you know, Ukraine is still on the spot. So uh, it's kind of a time of the summary. What would be your assessments? Do you think how important were they? Was, was they have they shown something to us? Have they, um, can we learn something from the, both the results and the way election had been held? Even, especially compared to all the elections in Ukraine, which were always like a big uh, kind of mess. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's certainly, certainly a certain extent of the people who voted, we're not quite sure what they've said about it. But um, they have, in many ways, um, confirmed a few things. They've said, um, you know, I think, I, I think they still do say that Poroshenko is the Tina, that there is no alternative candidate for president, still. I think they say that Timoshenko's comeback doesn't look to have happened yet. I think they say that um, Kolomoisky, um, Kolomoisky was funding pretty much every political party going. A lot of people voted for him, unsurprisingly. Um, and he is the, 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 the real threat. I think that's what they, 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 they confirmed to us. I mean, the, in that sense, they were very useful. And, of course, they showed the split of the East.
Well, it seems like part of it is trying to fill a void. You know, it's trying to create national forces and how far they can go. Opposition bloc showed itself to be more limited than many may have expected. You don't have a real successor to the party of the regions in terms of representing the Russian-speaking East. You have Poroshenko, who himself is seen as a national leader, but his party is not able to field successful candidates in many of the larger yeah. cities. And you have Samopomich, which did better, but still tends to be a party rooted in Western Ukraine, have struggling to really, you know, come into power. But elsewhere. still, some of which is not yet ready to wield the knife. It still didn't do well enough to, to be the one to walk out of coalition and yeah, say, right, yeah. let's have the, pro the, the early parliamentary shit. elections. That's the, the other thing which came out of this. Early parliamentary elections, which everyone was talking about before, I think have been kicked into the long grass because none of the people who can force the early parliamentary elections would gain much from, from doing it. Tymoshenko wouldn't gain much. I don't think Sadovoy would gain much. And in that, in that respect, I think it was a, a, a big relief for Poroshenko, even yeah. though there's, there's, there's obviously... In yeah. the, in, on, on the national level, it really preserves the, the status quo. We can expect that the, the, the coalition in the Verkhovna Rada is going to survive for a little bit longer. Maybe they can pass the, ref, the constitutional reform and the decentralization reform. And so we, we, don't, we don't expect any more uh, early elections, snap elections, as we, as we could expect just two weeks ago. So that's, uh, that, that's basically what I, what I take from these elections. But this um, December will be interesting, I think. There is always something. <laughs> There's <is> always <laughs> more to come. We can't expect who will be arrested tomorrow. <laughs> no. uh, so thanks a lot. Uh, thanks to Sébastien Gobert, the French reporter here from writing for Libération Le Monde Diplomatique, and Oliver Carroll writing for The Independent and The Politico, not just that. Um, and before moving to the next part, we also would like to... Um, Focus on the uh, report our team had filmed near Luhansk. Uh, there you can see the small town of Stanitsa Luhanska. It's just some kilometers from the Luhansk, which is on the on the territory under the uh, separatist control. And there we've managed to film. Romatsky have managed to film the bridge uniting to this uh, these territories. Uh, the crews had been working. Uh, at the different sides and finally has, has shown how the movement started and how the families can meet each other at this bridge. Uh, so this is a report bridging the war from Hromatsky. Завершуюсь підготовку техніки до зими та готуються до завтрашнього відведення артилерії з калібром до 100 мм. Сьогодні нагадую службові останній день верифікації відведення танків. Почому риба? Давайте мені Берут? Да, но ж людей нет уж никого, не пропускают же, что вообще, что, и, может, что солдаты испугались, а люди тут нет, понимают. Говорят, с города же будут люди, может, разберут что-то у нас, ну, что-то с городом мало сегодня, не знаю. Там что-то проходили не, несколько не, человек. Не-не, мы не видели, мне Луанчан многих знаю, но мы тут их не видели. Не видели что-то. Сегодня не видели. Там, говорят, нет, полно нет. стоит на мосту людей. Там какой-то -то дедушка прошел, то две бабушки, ну, вообще, не, не мая. Наверное, не будет. Никого. Вон, свиная, свиная голова. Пять мы, братан, а что еще? Приходится за свиными ушами ездить на сопредельную территорию вокруг через изварено а сейчас а сейчас напрямки до 
Глава Луганской Народной Республики в и ответил на наиболее актуальные вопросы. Игорь Плотницкий рассказал об борьбе с коррупцией, ходе восстановительных работ, коснулись системы выполнения Украины Станица без Луганска ничего нема. И да, Луганска да. без станицы. Это же у нас не привыкли, да, мы связаны район. Ну, можете связаны. поверить, это же мы связаны. У, у меня сын живет, там, брат, внучат. невестка, племянник. Да, да, все из Луганска. Да, вот да полтора года вот, тому назад. я уже и год не вижу. Не надо кричать, не надо меньше пить, не надо меньше пить. Вы не Вы кто? Я не слышу, что Пожалуйста, пожалуйста. А, давно дома не были? Ой, уже с мая месяца. Ну, что ж, не К сыну ездили учиться у нас там. Спасибо вам терпение, знамы дурака. Здесь тоже самое. Пропустить с российской мовы, потому что по паспорту вы Володимиром, а там на Владимир. Вы здесь не вы сами. Вот так вы что? Если сын не знает, как маму по батьку, то я же не виноват, правда? У меня муж там в городе, туда-сюда, ну надо же хоть встретиться, муж старый уже. Ну я очень довольна, все хорошо сделала. И как встреча прошла ваша? На высшем уровне, только 15 минут, 10 минут, я спешила обратно. А там очередь, я не наглела, это сколько нас не пропускали, я не знаю. С мая, да? Да, с мая я ни разу, ну так, по телефону разговариваем, по скайпу разговариваем. Ну, картошки хоть отсюда отвезти, там же ж голодовка, вы же знаете. А он старый, пенсия. Ну, в общем, вот я довольна, что сегодня попала, но только я под таким впечатлением, что, наверное, что-то не то говорю. Да, спасибо всем. Да, да, да. что Украина вынуждена отводить свои подразделения из так называемой зоны АТО из-за тяжелого морально-психологического состояния бойцов. Далее цитат. We can talk a lot about reforms, there are a lot of questions, but it's not often clear. So uh, tonight we've invited uh, Taras Kachka, who is, could be called a business ombudsman, uh, working with the Ukrainian, within the Ukrainian State Fiscal Service, uh, but one of the key Ukrainian experts on the European integration, uh, former uh, acting president of the American Chamber of Commerce here, who will explain us how to do that, because more or less Taras is working for the interest of business, to help the business to reach the government and explain the government what are the troubles are. Um, so how is it? Oh, it's, it's complicated, for sure, so, uh, but uh, first of all, I, I, it's manageable. So uh, in any case, uh, whatever uh, developments, Ukraine is really a good, uh, good market for, for investments, good uh, state for investments, and uh, despite all uh, volatilities and all turbulences, we see examples of uh, new investments, new big projects, uh, like, for example, 
the R&D center of Ericsson in Lviv and the announcement of establishment of full R&D uh, um, uh, center in Lviv, other capacities development of seaports, infrastructure in Ukraine. So all these news, they, news, uh, they piece of news, they are really maybe rare for, for such a big country for this year, but given, given uh, all the turbulences, all the problems, all the economic uh, uh, difficulties we, we face uh, and we continue to, to can continue facing when we are talking about, for example, currency control and, and uh, microfinance stability. I think even, even in these circumstances we are attractive for, for investments and uh, despite losses of territory we have the same, same similar harvest in, uh, in cereals, in grain, in wheat and, and barley. So uh, it means that Ukraine is a, is a good state for, for, for doing business, but of course uh, circumstances or in business environment is far from being normal and we see a lot of problems uh, companies have with uh, compliance with Ukrainian tax and customs legislations, absolute, uh, a lot of ex examples of unpredictable behavior of uh, fiscal and customs officers. We have a lot of problems with uh, property protection and uh, uh, really vague, uh, vague, uh, uh, vague criminal, uh, criminal acti so not uh, criminal uh, law, which result in a very offensive uh, policy or very offensive attitude from law enforcement agencies uh, towards uh, a lot of companies, especially you heard about number of scandals with different IT companies which was, which has suffered from uh, quite hostile behavior of uh, Ministry of Interiors, uh, uh, Secret Service and, and, and so on. Well, and when we look at what's happened, um, I mean, there is actually some good news, which people off outside of Ukraine don't often hear. I mean, there's a lot of, for, Ukraine's image has suffered a lot. It's connected with war and instability. But when we look at, for example, at the easy business ranking, we've seen Ukraine move up, I believe, three slots, um, which is impressive given everything else that's happened. Yeah, I think that this is one of, of rankings where the, the good, uh, good news is that we moved uh, uh, up for three uh, or four even uh, uh, places in this ranking. Uh, the, uh, another good news is that uh, unfortunately due to our, let's say, uh, lack of speed in, in taking decisions, uh, a lot of good initiatives are still in, in pipeline to, to be adopted and uh, initiatives which will improve our, our place in this ra ranking. On 10th of November we will have so-called doing business day in Parliament, so when a lot of draft laws which are already submitted uh, submitted to Parliament will be voted uh, in, in first and second reading. So next year it will be even better. Uh, and, and another good news is that in this uh, doing business re report there is a uh, additional uh, additional ranking or additional indicator uh, which shows also the the speed of reforms intensivity and uh, it's from one, from zero to one one mm -hmm. is the best uh, score uh, ever doing business any any country get in doing business starting mm -hmm. from 2005 and second year in, in a row we are increasing the speed of reform so the last year it was 0 0.62 this year it's, it is 0 0.6.34 so we are really increasing the, the, the speed of reform so when we look at these rankings what's changing is there just less bureaucracy or what, what's made it easier uh, so uh, let's be clear so that uh, once I heard a very um, let's say uh, critical approach to this doing business uh, ranking from Chinese uh, businessman he said that when Ukraine was on place 96 he said that uh, you know China is on place 90 so for us it, it doesn't matter so we have the similar business environment so so f you know the place sometimes doesn't matter mm -hmm. of course uh, so the problems you, uh, business has in, in Ukraine are not covered by this ranking so the mm -hmm. problems with law enforcement the problems with uh, corruption with pro problems of all these things uh, so th they are not covered by, 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 by this ranking therefore even if we will be number one in this ranking so the uh, so the problems will will be there or maybe mm -hmm. at that time in future when we will be number one we will uh, Ukrainian business will not face the, the, these problems therefore sometimes business is critical um, towards government 
government that you better resolve actual problems business has uh, have in, instead of uh, trying to improve your place in, in doing business uh, in doing mm -hmm. business work. However, it, it it good in any case because uh, abstract company in Hong Kong uh, trying to decide whether to invest in Ukraine or not will for sure take into account our place in this ranking and if we will be higher then uh, average it will be it will be good for for Ukraine. Uh, Taras, yeah, people in business um, they love uh, question, they love ranking all kinds of. So I'll ask I'll ask you as well. So if you would um, you know focus on let's say top three on a couple of things which had been done uh, by the different kind of authorities or not authorities yeah. uh, wherever which kind of were successful, and after maybe a couple which probably should be done and a couple of the obstacles. For sure, the one of uh, best uh, examples of good reforms is deregulation and deregulation, especially deregulation in agriculture. Uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian government, generally government, parliaments of government in general, uh, managed to cancel more than 100 different authorization, certificates, licenses, which existed in, 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 in agriculture. Uh, this is very it is extremely good example of uh, uh, the rule or the idea that business is doing well with, without governmental intervention. So despite cancelling of this enormous number of licenses, our harvest is e even increased or, or this on the same level. But it seems like part of that is, you know, you had a system set up often using corruption and other levers that wasn't competitive, that kind of gave monopolies or unfair advantages, and it seems like some of what's being done now is undoing that, trying to make yeah, it more competitive absolutely. again. Another good example, but this example is extremely painful and no one will agree that this is a good example. This is uh, this is example of bravery of uh, cleaning all the mess in banking sphere. So, uh, of course, we all suffer from it. We all uh, we are all suffering, continue suffering from transformation of our banking system. But the fact that National Bank of Ukraine managed to uh, close a big number of bad banks in, in the system managed to make the system healthier, uh, actually sign that, once again, government in general is ready for, also for painful reform. So we will for sure see positive results of this painful reform in banking and financial sector, uh, sector already beginning next year or end of ne next year when our banking and financial system will be stable enough to, to invite capital uh, and capital flow I into Ukraine, and I, I, be I believe that uh, all financial world really recognize this bravery and this uh, comprehensive in, in reforms. Yeah, so that was about the good things, but uh, as a business ombudsman, as you are often called, uh, when you approach the government, so what are also the things you say they have to do urgently and there where sh could be Absolutely. and should be the, the, the will of the state? This is an administration of justice, and, and quality of uh, law, rule of, rule of law, let's say. The quality of understanding of law by law enforcement agencies, especially uh, prosecution office, Ministry of, uh, Ministry of Interior, so our police, uh, criminal police, and uh, as well customs, uh, so tax, tax militia and, and state fiscal service in general. So the way how they apply law created a lot of problems. So when uh, company face the retroactive application of, of, of law when there are no uh, logical connection between facts, uh, rules and how they merge together and conclusions made by, uh, by inspectors or, or prosecutors or judges uh, irritating even so to, the, to the highest possible extent. So if uh, business is facing problems, if this problem is connected with the quality of administration of justice in general. And this is sometimes big, we have an example of one of big American company who, uh, which, which spent quarter of all the expenditures for legal legal services because almost each step in the activity connected with mm. courts with claims with uh, uh, different disputes with all kind of all well, and all that increases the cost of business yes. and, and, it's, and it, it irritates not only here in Ukraine the, this irritation 
uh, is going up to headquarters and if a headquarter of big uh, multinational company is irritated by behavior of Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian authorities, it means that they will not approve any, any further investments in, investments in Ukraine. But when you approach the government, do you feel that uh, there is an answer? Or, because I've talked to a number of different experts in different fields, so they feel the big difference be between the previous government, it was very, very hard to uh, reach them, and they would either denial or won't do this, but currently you have a lot of agreement, you know, people are like saying yes, 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 we understand, we'll do that, we'll do that, but the reality is different. So what is your feeling? I think that, uh, so I think that we, I wish we were similar brave in law enforcement reforms and, and in judicial reform as, as we are brave in, in, in banking sector, in, in financial sector. I think that uh, we, for sure, on, on good, uh, in good tra trajectory on, uh, on the resolving problems in judiciary, but we are moving so slow that it it's also irritates also those who are advocating in favor of investments to Ukraine. So I, I, th I strongly believe that we could, we could move faster in judicial reform, we could be uh, more radical in, in reform of prosecution, and in, in reforms of uh, in uh, um, hiring new judges and hiring new prosecutors, uh, creating new state fiscal service. So the, this project is also in, in, pi in pipeline. It's in, in the process of state fiscal service in the process of transformation, also positive transformation. But we are still in this, you know, perfect storm of in terms of HR policies, in, in terms of mm. rules and so on. So uh, we need to. Um, I think that to close this period of, of uh, reforms with successful results, but as soon as as soon as possible. You get your hands on. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining thank us you. and giving us that update. Uh, now we want to take a closer look at Russia flight KGL KGL 9268. So this was the flight that tragically crashed in the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula. It killed all 224 people on board. That included three Ukrainians and one Belarusian. Uh, ISIL had claimed responsibility, but investigators are really focusing on on technical issues. Here in Kiev, Ukrainians took flowers to the Russian embassy. Uh, we have a video of that for you now. погибли, понимаете? Безразлично чего это, но они погибли. Да. Скажите, как плакать вас... хочется. Скажите, как вас представить? In order to uh, talk about that, to ask about the, um, what is the, um, not just Russian uh, reaction, but also an expertise, and also talk more about the Russian involvement in Syria, what's going on, uh, about the first, uh, not the first, but really the casualties among the uh, Russian soldiers in Syria. We are calling to Konstantin von Eggert, a famous Russian journalist, commentator, and the radio host from the Commerçant Radio. Uh, he's joining us. Uh, currently being in Vilnius. Um, Kostya, thanks for, uh, Konstantin, thanks a lot for being with us this late evening. Um, so definitely the first, uh, the first question we would like to approach. Uh, there was uh, um, information that ISIS has uh, taken responsibility for, um, for the plane crash, uh, for firing this plane, but there was a totally different uh, information from the uh, Russian expert that that didn't take place. Maybe you would explain us a bit what really you know about the case. Let me put it like that. Uh, we are pretty much confused about the 
what really happened there. On the one hand, we have the ISIS video, which purports to show the uh, purports to show the downing of the Russian airliner. Uh, on the other hand, we have um, reports from the Russian and Egyptian authorities uh, that the airliner was flying at an uh, altitude of um, about. 30,000 feet or 10,000 kilometers, uh, sorry, 10 kilometers, uh, which means that any shoulder held missile that ISIS could possess uh, would not be able to shoot it down. So it's pretty much confused. Um, I have to say that, judging by my own experience uh, in Russia, you don't have to have ISIS to down the Russian charter plane. They're usually pretty much uh, worn out and, uh, um, and uh, uh, pretty much used, I would say. I think that uh, the information that we have um, is that uh, this plane uh, was making its 17th run in a week. So that is pretty, pretty intense exploitation. Um, I have to say that um, if you watch Russian television channels, uh, they show uh, a lot of coverage of this uh, tragic event, um, and uh, all Russian state channels are insisting uh, very adamantly that uh, there is no terrorism there, just um, a malfunction of the plane, and the only question is whether there was um, something that was completely objective, something broke down and that's it, uh, tragic as it is, or uh, the company that was ex that was using the plane, that, that, that was leasing the plane, uh, wasn't uh, too good at servicing it. Um, I think that what we see is uh, that the Russian government, via its media channels, wants to make it very clear that terror is not involved. And that is quite clear why. Uh, because um, if there is suspicion that uh, uh, Russian planes start to fall out of the sky uh, because of the Russian involvement in Syria, that may color Russian involvement in Syria in different colors uh, than uh, it is colored now by, by Russian propaganda. I mean, to turn that in a different direction, since you've mentioned Russian reaction to military uh, involvement in Syria, I mean, what has been the reaction to the first uh, official casualty, this 19-year-old Vadim uh, Kostenko? Uh, obviously, the military authorities are saying this was a suicide. His uh, relatives had inspected the body, found that he had a broken nose and neck, uh, not neck, sorry, a broken nose and jaw, suggesting other results. I know you spoke to his uncle, so what has been the reaction to this case? Uh, yes, Ian, I think that there's a lot of confusion there, too. Uh, the relatives that we spoke to, including his uncle, do not believe it's a suicide. Uh, on the other hand, he was a technician. He wasn't in any combat duty. So what happened to Vadim remains, let's say, a matter to contest. It's quite also obvious to me that, as of now at least, the relatives of the dead soldier do not want to let this thing go. So they seem to be convinced uh, that uh, it was not a suicide because of hopeless love. Moreover, his uncle insisted in an interview with um, my radio station, Commerçant FM, uh, that um, his love life was in order. Moreover, his girlfriend was a pretty recent one. So uh, in a sense, uh, there wasn't, let's put it like that, enough love to be d d d disenchanted with. And um, I suppose that um, this will remain an issue for uh, quite some time. Uh, there are no other reports of Russian casualties, which to my mind uh, says that actually we only have uh, Russian Air Force uh, mm -hmm. being involved in a strike. Well, we have no, other, we have so, no un other confirmed cases. We've seen other reports yes, from yes, Reuters. We, nothing was reported, but I think it's mm -hmm. quite difficult to hide it because you have to have a military funeral, you have mm -hmm. um, a relative, so uh, this is something that, um, um, that uh, will be, I would say, pretty mm -hmm. difficult to hide. It's not impossible, but pretty mm -hmm. difficult. But you I mean, we've seen we've seen in Ukraine we we've seen in Ukraine you know these sort of secret funerals. People encouraged not to speak about it. You know, a lack of cause for soldiers. I mean, when you have someone who who's 19, an age when many Russians are doing their mandatory military service, does this have the potential to change Russian opinion about action in Syria? You know, I have to say that I looked at it long and hard, and as someone who age-wise remembers the war in Afghanistan pretty well. And uh, I remember my mother being worried that I will be called up and sent off to Kandahar. 
Um, uh, I can tell you that it's a slightly different situation. Uh, for well, well the, the main reason why it's different is that um, it's mostly or the majority of the soldiers and officers that um, are in Syria now are contract soldiers. Mm -hmm. They are not conscripts as it was in Afghanistan and to some extent in the first Chechen war. Uh, which means that um, essentially it's their job to, to go and fight. And this changes the society's attitude. Unless there are mass casualties, I don't think the Russian public opinion will be, uh, will be that much sort of shocked by what goes on in Syria. With regard to Ukraine, it's also different because the Russian government has managed to convince the majority of Russians that uh, there are no regular Russian troops in Ukraine. Untrue as it is, uh, it is something that the uh, that Russian television, which is the source, the main source of news and views for 90% of the population of Russia, uh, managed to sort of fix in people's minds. There are no, there are no Russian soldiers there, only volunteers, only those who took up the holiday to fight in Donbass. And I suppose that in Syria it's different. Uh, I just watched uh, main Russian television news, uh, sort of the roundup, roundup of the week. 50% um, of the time is dedicated to Syria. No one hides the fact that Russians are involved, Russian army, uh, Russian air force rather, is involved in Syria. So it's a different situation from Ukraine. Nobody hides this involvement as opposed to Ukraine. And as I said, at least for now, it seems that, um, uh, that uh, there are no major casualties to hide. What I would like to say though, Ian and, and uh, Natalia, um, is that um, the effect of this operation um, has to be sterling silver, has to, you have to deliver in Syria to justify that you've been there, either in the form of some kind of peace process or in the form of a resolute victory for uh, President Assad against Kostya, uh, uh, Kostya, but that would be... That this is very difficult to deliver. Yeah, that would follow, uh, that would be the uh, following question from me. When we talked the last time, there was this hype when there was a start of this recent and huge Russian involvement, the Kremlin involvement in Syria. There was a lot of discussion how big it would be. We know about 2,000 soldiers. Uh, we know that not always uh, there are it's ISIS which is targeted but, but vice versa, the Frisian army or the other positions. Uh, so uh, within these weeks, um, what has changed? What is the Russian strategy in Syria? Um, how mi big is the, uh, you know, military involvement? What is the political involvement? What are the goals and target at this moment? I think that, um, as you rightly said, we've spoken a few weeks ago about that, a couple of weeks ago. I don't think that the main goal has changed. Uh, I think that um, what President Putin tries to achieve with limited uh, resources, uh, by not sending any kind of uh, real um, detachments on the ground, but limiting himself to uh, airstrikes. So what he wants to achieve is actually to make the United States listen to our view. For President Putin, uh, it's not so much uh, the fate of Bashar al-Assad that counts. It's rather his desire to what he sees uh, to, to put pay to what he sees as the American policy of regime change. He wants to be the victor over America, if you wish, uh, putting a stop, um, making the buck stop in Syria. Uh, I think that uh, his idea of a good outcome is actually to involve the United States in some kind of direct talks with um, the Assad regime, well, probably uh, in, in the form of a round table, uh, and we see that happening now in Vienna, all these kind of international talks. He also wants to include Iran in this uh, particular circle of important global powers that decide the uh, fate of Syria, uh, because Russia's bet on its alliance in Iran uh, in countering the United States' um, influence in the Middle East. Frankly speaking, that's my personal view, of course. I think that he succeeds not so much, or at least was succeeding until now, not so much because his resources are so great or he knows the Middle East very well or he's such a great player there or Russia is such a great player there. No, I think he succeeded because the American administration was willing to see these positions, uh, is not engaged, uh, has drawn 
uh, red lines that repeatedly show that these are not red lines, but the best well, pink lines, if you wish. Um, I think it's the weakness and disengagement of the Obama administration that actually uh, makes it so easy for all other external forces to play this role. And I think that in this respect, Putin is using uh, the White House's um, desire to keep its, um, uh, its quote-unquote achievement of a deal with Iran intact to basically promote its own agenda in Syria. But I think for Putin, again, the main thing still is not so much military victory, but uh, basically showing to the world that the American policy of regime change, as he sees it, can be stopped. And for him, that's, I think, the number one goal of the Konstantin, thanks a lot for this detailed uh, explanation. Um, I think that was uh, very interesting for the audience to understand and to hear this point of view. It was Konstantin von Egger, the Russian uh, journalist, the host of the Kamersant FM. And uh, coming back to Kiev, uh, we do have uh, in our studio Vyacheslav Lihachov, who is the head of the National Minority Rights Monitoring Group, and he's an expert from Eurasian Jewish Congress. Uh, residing in Israel but working a lot uh, in Ukraine and in, in the region uh, with um, different human rights organizations, with the Jewish Congress and many, many, um, many more, uh, speaking a lot about what's happening now. Um, so the topic we probably would touch a few, it's also this monitoring of the uh, minority rights in Ukraine, but also that you're writing a lot uh, and explaining a lot about all the far rights in Ukraine, um, which was a very, very, uh, you know, hot topic in the foreign media, but you're an expert. You're somebody who counts, who knows, who has an expert, who, who have an expertise. So uh, you've recently written a piece on uh, Ukrainian and Russian volunteer far rights in Russian-Ukrainian war. And so what would be your major, you know, stake on that if you would explain it to those who don't know to that level? Good evening. Uh, first of all, of course, it's natural that far rights were involved in a uh, uh, Russian-Ukrainian war from the both sides. And it's also true that the Ukrainian part was more in focus of foreign media and foreign politicians, uh, partly because uh, in Ukraine it is also an agenda in a national media. In Ukraine there are independent national media. In Ukraine there is a civil society which pay attention to this question. So it was in agenda also of international media speaking about about Ukraine. Uh, second, Ukraine tried to be or pretend to be a part of European society with European standards of what is human rights, what is rights of minorities, and for um, from point of view of European society, it's strange when uh, neo-Nazi groups with uh, open far-right rhetoric and uh, symbols became an official uh, battalion or other military groups in frames of Ministry of Interior or Ministry of Defense. That's a, that's a little bit strange. But actually, uh, from my point of view, in a real military action, the role of Russian neo-Nazi and far-right groups in Donbass were much more important, uh, partly because uh, the role of volunteers, or so-called volunteers, is much more important on the Donbass pro-Russian side. The Russian uh, openly military involved was only in uh, several the, moments. And I mean, I mean, you uh, have for far rights groups were, from the very beginning, the core of the uh, so-called separatist military forces. And I mean, I, since coming from Israel and there, are these groups talked about much? I mean, is there discussion about these far-right groups or concern or for the Jewish community? Yes, of course. In Israel, uh, it's um, uh, the, the most important subject is uh, their uh, situation with Jewish community. Uh, Jews are really in danger because neo-Nazi have mm -hmm. weapons with their uh, anti-Semitic rhetoric, um, 
they openly used, so it is in focus. Uh, but from the very beginning, it was much more attention because it was a fear about this situation. Now there is an understanding uh, that uh, Jews are not uh, part of the conflict. They are not on uh, uh, agenda of the conflict, and there, there is a rise of uh, repatriation, aliyah, from uh, Ukraine to Israel, but it is not because of danger of anti-Semitism, but just because of the general situation. And uh, Vyacheslav, you write a lot about the myth, and what in this case, there is a lot of speculation on anything connected, and anti-Semitism, that's the card the Russia plays, but at the same time, there is sometimes the denial to discuss also from the, you know, some Ukrainian government government officials or even the Ukrainian society, um, and if not to speak about the myth, but about the reality, what would be your assessment of the, you know, what would be the problem, what would be the issue to watch out and focus? Yes, really, there are two sides of the discussion from the one side from uh, Russian official propaganda, from pro-Russian analytical and um, semi-human rights groups which supported by Kremlin, also international ones, uh, there is a, a lot of speeches about danger of anti-Semitism, rise of anti-Semitism, dangers for the Jews in Ukraine. And from the other hand, uh, there is a reaction of Ukrainian officials and the Ukrainian society, and sometimes from the Ukrainian Jewish community, that uh, there is no anti-Semitism uh, at all in Ukraine. And uh, the truth, as always, is between. Uh, we provide a monitoring of I hate crimes, including anti-Semitic ones, and what we can see is that uh, there is um, some level of hate crimes as in other Eastern European countries. The general situation with anti-Semitism for different reasons is much more better than in uh, Western European countries. And there is, what is important to stress, there is no uh, rise of anti-Semitic violence, hate crimes uh, during uh, revolution and during the war from the for last two I years. I mean, what I hear from what you're saying is that Ukraine is similar to other countries in terms of the far right and in terms of hate crimes. Is there anything exceptional about Ukraine when it comes to right-wing groups? Because sometimes in Ukraine, you know, this is my subjective experience, right-wing groups um, are trusted to get things done in a more serious way than other parties. Is that something reflected at all in the research you've done? Well, the situation is complicated because uh, from the one hand, uh, there are really a number of radical right group with uh, very clear and open uh, neo-Nazi rhetoric with symbols of um, Nazi German times. And from the other hand, uh, Till now, for last year and a half, they have a real enemy. They have a situation of the real war. So uh, they have a totally different agenda than uh, radical rights in Europe or all over the world have. They don't need to find uh, enemy on the streets of the Ukrainian cities because they have a real military enemy and a real possibility to struggle for the Ukrainian national ideas that they understand stand on a front line. So uh, from the one hand, there is, we really think that uh, Ukrainian far-right groups and their rhetoric um, became more legitimized in eyes of society. But from the other hand, we can see that their uh, agenda and what is important for them right now is a totally changed from their agenda two or three years ago. And um, in general, uh, during the whole this uh, time of the conflict, you were, um, in different of the publication, you were raising the issue of the hate speech, of, you know, it's always uh, during the time of the war, the society is uh, really probably becoming uh, sometimes aggressive, sometimes very traumatized, but also that would be the issue in the Ukrainian media. I mean, we know not speaking now about the Russian media, because there is a huge, you know, um, anyways, it's a two different um, realities for everything about the one or the other. Um, so what would be your assessment now? Has things has changed? Uh, sometimes you kind of raised in the barriers. Uh, what should be, we also worry now or shouldn't we? Well, what was in the focus of our monitoring is uh, hate speech against ethnic minorities. So it is a little bit different than hate speeches between two sides of the conflict. Uh, but from the very beginning of the conflict, it was a fear that uh, there are um, 
Russians, Russian speaking, uh, or IDPs from the uh, eastern regions, they will face a xenophobic reaction in the media, in social networks, and so it uh, has an influence to the mass mentality. Uh, but uh, now, as far as we see, uh, the wave of such kind hate speeches uh, was, uh, was not so big, and it uh, maximum was in the middle of the previous year, in the very beginning of the conflict, when it was not clear will the conflict stop in the eastern region or will be next to uh, some other cities or regions of the conflict. And I think that till now the situation of of course, it is um, very uh, dangerous, but it is not uh, very horrible. All right, well, we'll continue to watch that situation. Thank you so much for joining us. There, that was Vyacheslav Lihachov, who is uh, running the group of monitors on the uh, minorities' rights. And uh, that's all for now. Thanks a lot. Uh, but uh, to um, let you know, next week Gramatska would run its show not from Kyiv, but from Riga. There we have been invited to um, work at the Riga conference, uh, also on the security. So Gramatska International is getting more and more international. Uh, with headquarters, I hope, from very different uh, European, Eastern European capitals. So that's uh, we would watch next week. 